My name is Ed Sikora. I'm an extension plant pathologist with the Auburn University. My email, in case you want to contact me later, is uh, sikorej at auburn.edu. I also post a lot on Twitter, uh, and my Twitter handle is Alabama Ed, but post a lot of pictures of uh, sick plants. Start off with some healthy looking strawberries. Uh, this is down at Slide on the left is Burr's Farms down in Baldwin County or, or in Fo Foley, Alabama. Many of you probably know his operation. He's been doing it for 30 years, does a great job. Um, walked through that field and could not find any disease that day, which uh, I guess I was happy to see. Uh, on the right is a nice basket of fresh strawberries picked at Dempsey Farm, which is just uh, north of Auburn near uh, south of Lafayette. But that's pretty much what you're you're aiming for to produce as a as a grower. Um, unfortunately, you get problems like this: and leaf blights on the left. You get uh, root rots and crown rots in the center, and also fruit rots on the right, which are showing up right about now. And all all these can be cost a significant amount of money, and in some cases, devastate the crop. Uh, I like to start off with just a simple definition of what a plant disease is, and I define it as any disturbance of a plant that interferes with its normal growth and development. We talk about biotic diseases, which are caused by living agents such as bacteria, fungi, nematodes, viruses, and then abiotic diseases caused by non-living agents, often uh, related to Mother Nature, maybe flooding, uh, uh, cold weather, and so forth, frost injury. Just a couple of examples of abiotic diseases. Uh, this poor pollination I saw up in Edgar's area up in Clanton, uh, possibly uh, this poor pollination uh, leading to this disfigured fruit, kind of looks like a bird. A right was sun scald, uh, some fruit on a black plastic mulch was years ago, but it, it went from relatively cold to warm and those fruit were exposed and you had damage like that. So abiotic problems are out there. Insect problems are out there like Ash had just talked about. We're going to talk about strawberry diseases. Um, broke these down into a, a, a few leaf spots, both fungal and bacterial, uh, two crown rots, root rots, and anthracnose and phytophthora. Then we'll talk more, uh, more heavily on the fruit rots, um, which are probably the most obvious ones, especially this time of year during harvest season. So botrytis, anthracnose, fruit rot, uh, neopestilosia, sheopsis, which I can't pronounce. A uh, new disease that Dr. Connor in our diagnostic lab detected uh, not long ago this year. And also rhizopus rot, which oftentimes shows up post-harvest, many times in your, in your kitchen, in your refrigerator, on, or on your uh, kitchen counter. Uh, as far as the leaf spots are concerned, we do have a couple fungal uh, leaf spot problems that are, are common in, in backyard gardens more than in commercial fields, I'd say. Uh, this is strawberry leaf spot or common leaf spot uh, caused by a fungal pathogen. Oftentimes you see these uh, tan to brown lesions surrounded by a darker margin. These could be red to purple in, in color. Uh, you can see on the left, many of these lesions start to emerge and you get uh, blighting of the foliage and eventually fall off. And typically these show up on the older leaves of the plant. And if, if you're not a, on a fungicide spray program, uh, these, these are going to probably pop up. This is a uh, strawberry leaf blight, another disease. Sometimes you see both those diseases on the same plant. Uh, oftentimes you get these tannish lesions in the center. You can see some target-like patterns developing. On the right, you can see where these lesions start to merge. And many times you'll see almost like a U or a V-shaped lesion extending out to the leaf edge. And that leaf eventually uh, turns brown and dies. Uh, both of these diseases are, are pretty easily controlled with uh, fungicides. So with common, it's a, it first appears as small, round, purplish red spots on the upper leaf surface. Uh, leaf death can occur when num numerous spots merge. And many of these, this is often introduced into fields on infected transplants. And I highlight infected transplants because I think with just about every disease I talk about today, one of the ways the disease gets started is coming in on infected material. Uh, common leaf spot is spread within a field by splashing water. 
uh, high rainfall, warm temperatures will favor rapid disease development. As far as leaf blight, the spots become target-like and only have a purple or yellow or even a yellow margin to them. Uh, older lesions are, as I mentioned, are usually uh, V-shaped at the leaf edge, leading to a blight of the entire leaf. And similar weather conditions favor uh, leaf blight as leaf spots. So that's why I say uh, oftentimes you might see these together in the same field. Uh, I mentioned resistant varieties. I believe there are a few that have resistance to these pathogens. Disease-free transplants, uh, when you do get your transplants in, uh, clean up some of the dead tissue on them. And, uh, and then applying a protective fungicide. So a product like Captan applied before these diseases show up, uh, control them well. Captan, some of the other uh, uh, protective materials that are used by commercial growers do a, do a great job on keeping these in check. And more times than not, I see it late in the season when the fungicide programs have been abandoned or in home garden situations. Next disease is angular leaf spot. And this is a bacterial disease. It's the only bacterial disease we'll talk about today, but it gets its name from the very sharp angles to the lesions caused by the pathogen. Uh, the bacteria get inside the leaf tissue, but they have a hard time crossing some of those major veins. So you get these, these sharp angular lesions. So it, it's fairly easy to pick up in the field once you get used to seeing it. Um, typically it's a cooler weather disease, likes it wet like most of these diseases, uh, but a cooler weather uh, pathogen. So it begins as um, small water-soaked yellow lesions on the lower leaf. Uh, these yellow flecks will develop on the upper surface and they'll eventually turn that reddish brown color. And the lesions will enlarge to become these angular spots, uh, sort of merge more or less. And they're limited by the leaf veins. Symptoms could also be visible on the calyx of the fruit. And I'll show you a slide of this, but the bacterium does not actually go to the fruit, but that calyx damage that does uh, reduce marketability of that infected fruit. Now the bacterium can't survive on dead leaves in the field, so it can be there from one year to the next. It could also be introduced on transplants. And then plant to plant movement uh, within the field is by splashing water. And I mentioned cooler temperatures favor angular leaf spot. So with management, we're looking at disease-free planting stock, purchasing even from a reputable dealer. I do recommend uh, copper fungicides uh, when this disease shows up as they can be effective in reducing bacterial problems and also help you with some of your fungal leaf spots. But you gotta watch with coppers and sulfur products, some, uh, some of these products because they can cause a foliar burn. If they're overused or if temperatures suddenly, you know, in Alabama, they might be 90 degrees tomorrow. Uh, some of these products can't be more uh, can't cause an actual burn to the plant and cause more damage than the pathogen itself. So be careful with them, read the label before using any product. So a couple early uh, development of, ang of uh, angular leaf spot on the left and center. If you were to cut one of those lesions with a razor blade and stick it on a dissect or a micro uh, compound scope in the lab, what you would see would be bacterial ooze coming out. And that's that gray and the slide on the right, the uh, that gray mass of spores coming out. It's probably thousands of bacterial spores oozing from one single lesion. And that's why these diseases really take off these bacterial problems under the right conditions. So with angular leaf spot, uh, we mentioned water soaking. And, and an example of that is on the left, on the lower half of that leaf, you can see kind of a, just a dark, almost like a water droplet that's drying off. And that's water soaking. And that'd be the initial sy symptom for angular leaf spot. You could hold those leaves up to the sun, as I did on the right, and then you can see those yellow flecks where the pathogen causes its initial infection site. And then eventually that'll turn reddish brown and the bacterium move and, and reproduce rapidly. And there's the image on the calyx I mentioned. And this I, I noticed uh, years ago now, but uh, I was able to get bacterial ooze from the calyx. Uh, it dries down, making that, that fruit a little bit less likely to be picked by a you picker in your operation. Um, it doesn't go to the fruit, uh, but damage has already been done when that fruit looks unedible. So angular leaf spot, not a problem this year. Uh, at least I haven't seen it in a couple of years, to be honest with you, but uh, it's out there along with your other leaf plants. Wanted to move down into the soil, into the crown of the plant. 
a couple of crown and root rot diseases, namely uh, anthracnose crown rot and then Phytophthora root and crown rot. And uh, Phytophthora is, we have that probably the most common problem coming through the diagnostic lab, um, according to Dr. Connor, our, our, our fine diagnostician. Uh, anthracnose crown rot, oftentimes, if, if it comes in on transplants, it could be a significant problem to growers. Um, on the left, what happens is they, they, they'll plant their plants, and then in, in a short time, many of these plants will start to die off. Uh, you see a plant in the center that has uh, both Phytophthora and spider mites. Uh, Ash had a nice slide that almost looks identical to that one. Uh, on the right is uh, what I believe is Phytophthora. Dr. Connor noticed this field in uh, Bruton a few a couple months ago, diagnosed Phytophthora in the field and the grower lost plants. But with Phytophthora, sometimes those plants will uh, revive themselves basically, but they'll be, show that stunting that you see on the right side of that bed. So with anthracnose, what you're going to see is, um, well, it may attack the crowns. Anthracnose has, there's three different species of anthracnose, and some are more common as, uh, one is more common for the crown rot phase. And I'll talk about anthracnose fruit rot later, which is typically a different species. So you get different phases of the same disease. Uh, but plants may die after being transferred to the field, infected plants. Uh, the wilted plants will have a reddish brown uh, crown. So if you, you cut the crown open longitudinally, and I'll show you a slide of this, you'll see a, this discoloration on the inside. It'll be a firm rod of the crown. Um, can be hard to ID based on crown symptoms of dying plants because the crowns typically turn brown in short order. So, um, which the same thing happens with frost injury, uh, flooding of a plant dies, the crown is going to turn brown in, in, in a short period of time. But infected transplants seem to be the main source of the disease in Alabama. So in management, you wanna plant disease-free material when possible. Uh, hard to pick up this disease by looking at the transplants as they come in. Scout the field early on and remove dying plants as soon as possible. So even in the fall after, after planting or in the early winter period, look for plants that are dying, check to see if they might have symptoms of anthracnose and then discard those as quickly as possible so it doesn't spread. And then as the season progresses, you wanna follow a protective fungicide program early in the season to try and keep that disease in check. So on thracnose on the left, you can see on the upper leaves, uh, upper left corner, that plant starting to die down. Uh, if you, what you wanna do is uh, sacrifice one of those plants that is still green, but obviously on its way out and cut the stem open, the crown open. And that's when you're gonna see this reddish brown discoloration in the crown tissue. You wait for the plant to be completely brown. It's just gonna be a brown crown and not gonna be able to tell you much of anything. And you see uh, just symptoms of anthracnose on the left from a healthy crown to one that is uh, completely been destroyed by it. Basically it's a firm rot, remember? Same picture on the right is what I just showed you earlier. So anthracnose crown rot, uh, significant disease when it does show up. Now if I top through a root and crown rot, uh, we used to call these water mold fungi. I um, guess that name from the, the wet conditions that this pathogen uh, prefers. And you'll often see plants like the one on the left that just suddenly wilt and die. You don't see a progression of the disease. It's just it, it goes down quickly. Slice the stem open on that. Again, you will look for maybe a pinkish rose color, but it can also be reddish brown to brown in the crown, usually in the upper part of the crown. Uh, some pictures from Dr. Connor to share with me from the lab from uh, earlier this year, I believe, which you can see uh, phytophthora root rot or crown rot and some of the symptoms inside of those crowns. So this disease really likes it wet. That's, that's the main thing with these water mold pathogens. So symptoms begin in the upper part of the crown. Uh, young leaves will wilt suddenly and you'll get com complete co uh, collapse, excuse me, of the plant uh, within days. And the plant sometimes will break at the upper part of the crown when you try and lift it from the soil uh, quickly. Cut that crown longitudinally. You may see a rose pink discoloration usually in the upper part of the crown. 
or it can be brown, and eventually that'll just disintegrate. Now, when the disease is not bad and when conditions dry out, maybe you get some warm temperatures, some of these plants will recover, but they're usually gonna be stunted um, and not produce as much as a, a healthy plant uh, during the season. Warm, wet conditions, poorly drained soils favor infection. Uh, so management, especially in a, in a commercial field, because Phytophthora can't survive in the soil as as uh, clusters of uh, resistant type spores. Fumigation would be an option if you have a limited space for planting or if you have a heavy infection. Uh, there are resistant varieties available. You wanna provide good soil drainage when choosing a site and you wanna avoid low wet fields or fields that have a history of this disease because it can be quite devastating when it gets going. Left, you can see a plant that eventually uh, was infected with Phytophthora. On the right is a slide I showed you earlier, but you see those plants appear to recover from Phytophthora, but they're what, about one, one fifth the size of those healthy plants on the left. Oftentimes you might see them in a row or a few plants together where the disease is spread from one plant to the next almost. Okay, let's get to the cool diseases, the uh, fruit rots. And these are, this is what you're seeing now if, you, if you're uh, picking your crop or if you have if you're you picking yourself, um, gray mold, detritus gray mold on the left. And on the right, you could see anthracnose fruit rot. And gray mold, of course, gets its name from the gray mold. So here's just different, different uh, levels of infection on strawberry fruit from left to right. But that gray stuff you see there is fungal mycelium, the body of the fungus, along with spores. On the right, it almost looks like that fruit is mummified by the pathogen. This, this stands out pretty much in the field. You'll, I'm sure any of you who've walked through strawberries or grow strawberries have seen this problem. It's an annual problem in Alabama, a little more common when we have uh, wet conditions like we had last year, especially in, in some cases in some parts this year. This is just a, a close-up of what the, that mycelium looks like, so these individual hypha, in the blue, and then off the hyphae, you get these clusters of botrytis spores in the, on the left-hand side of the screen. Looks like a, somebody bringing it over some flowers. And then in, under, in that star, you can see a couple individual spores. And if you see botrytis in the field, and if you just see that gray mass on the, on the uh, fruit, just flick it with your finger sometime if it's dry and you'll just see these spore clouds come off and that's individual spores being released. One of those spores land on a neighboring fruit, and they can infect the fruit directly. So it uh, gives you some idea how rapid this pathogen or how aggressive it can be. Uh, this was in an organic field last year uh, in our region, but you can see that grow mold forming. Again, if you just flick that with your finger, you'd see a mass of spores blown off. Typically, these fruit may, might show some darkening first, but the mold comes out fairly quickly. I mentioned it comes in on transplants. Now this is a, a garden store in uh, Lee County that I, when I when I go to a garden store, I look for diseases. I mean, most of you are probably picking out nice strawberry fruit or healthy flowers. I look for problems. Uh, this was just from a basket of strawberries being sold. These were uh, probably the last six plants left on the store shelf, but they had uh, fruit on them, which was interesting, but it also had gray mold on them. So this is something you wouldn't want to bring into your home garden, say. And uh, definitely, obviously, with a commercial grower, you'd want to avoid this, but it was just sort of interesting on, uh, at least in the garden center. Made for a nice picture. So with Botrytis gray mold, it's, it's widespread, has numerous hosts, survives on dead plant material. Free water, cool temperatures, favored development. So right now it's ideal uh, with, the, with the rain we had in uh, recent days. Uh, green berries appear to be more resistant to infection than red berries. Uh, management is to uh, avoid de disease transplants, which is hard to do, and avoid allowing overripened fruit to sit in the field. That's probably the biggest problem where growers have extended themselves uh, more acres than they needed. They can't pick them fast enough and these fruit just start to rot in the field. So what you'd like to do is remove and destroy the diseased fruit and, and uh, ash earlier talked about removing uh, fruit uh, with, with, with damage from insects, 
And the same thing with botrytis, you would like to get, take those fruit off the plant and then get them out of the field, and bury them. Um, I know a number of growers that they have time to remove the fruit, throw them in the center of the row, but then they, they leave them there. They, don't, they can't pick them up because they don't have enough time, don't have enough people power. And that's still a source of inoculum. This disease can be controlled with, with fungicides on a, on a strict schedule. Uh, you need to be, get ahead of it. Uh, Caftan is always a nice product to, to add to your mix, but there's a number of other products of different chemistries that are available. Uh, Dr. Connor, Dr. Vincent, and myself have been doing, uh, we've been doing some resistant profiling of fields over the last year and a half, looking for uh, populations of botrytis that are resistant to different fungicide classes, working with a professor over at the University of Georgia. We're continuing this project, but we, but we found in about 80% of the fields that um, many of the, many of the uh, botrytis populations were resistant to uh, the class one, I believe it was class 11 fungicides. So products like Topsamam would be, uh, people spraying it were, were not having any benefits from it. And uh, I, think, I think class 11 was the other one where you're having problems with uh, things like a bound, just not effective any longer. And that's problem throughout the Southeast, it's not in Alabama. Now with Rectos, fruit rot is also occurring. We saw it in about 25% of the fields last year, also seeing resistance to this fellow in, a, in some of the products. But uh, we don't see it as common as botrytis, but it was out there last year and I did see it this year. Uh, has that telltale kind of a sunken area on the fruit. Uh, they could range from tan to brown to uh, black. On the right, that was a field down in Bruton that had uh, five or six fruit on one plant. Uh, have to just, just move from plant to plant. Just different examples of anthracnose. I think the one in the upper left-hand corner, you can see the initial symptom in it. It almost looks like a thumbprint on these. In that one, but that might be the initial symptom and then you start getting more uh, darkening of the tissue. And the spores are then produced off that tissue as well. So the source of the pathogen is also from nursery stock, but it's hard to detect coming on in. Uh, disease itself is favored by rain, high humidity, warm temperatures, all common situations in Alabama. Uh, rain and wind can spread the, the disease across the field fairly quickly. And then the dark lesions can form on green fruit, but also on mature fruit as well. Then management is to buy plants from a reputable nursery, one that you or your uh, colleagues have had luck with in the past. Uh, plant anthracnose are resistant cultivars. And I, I threw Sweet Charlie up here as one. And I, Edgar, I hope that's, that's, that's the correct variety. Uh, but there are some available uh, for resistance to anthracnose. And you want to monitor fields for hot spots of anthracnose and then remove infected plants not just the fruit, but whole infected plants, you might be able to limit the amount of damage you see in the field from this disease or amount of spread. So the grower I talked to had anthracnose on his fruit a couple of weeks ago. I, I told him to remove that plant and a couple of plants next to it. And you might be able to uh, compartmentalize that disease and, and uh, keep it from spreading rapidly. Another disease, when you take those fruit off, you also want to get them out of the field, sanitation. So management, uh, there is a pre-planned dip that uh, Dr. Ed, uh, Edgar uh, discussed in a publication a couple of years ago. So certain fungicides, uh, one we use is switch, can be used as dips on your uh, transplants to reduce incidence of anthracnose and gray mold uh, before planting. And typically when your transplants come in, you, you mix up the solution of the fungicide and then submerge the transplants in the dip for at least, or dip them in, in the solution for at least two minutes and then plant, and that can reduce your initial inoculum load. Uh, if you have problems, you wanna begin fungicide uh, program early and follow the guidelines. And I would, I would follow the guidelines outlined in, in the Southeast Regional Strawberry IPM Guide 2022. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all the chemicals because it, it gets complicated very quickly, but. Websites down in the bottom, but if you just get your, go to your Google machine and type in Southeast Strawberry IPM Guide 2022, and it'll take you to that link. 
And then uh, there's great information. I think Ash mentioned uh, on uh, insect control, weed control, uh, variety selection, and also on disease control. I think on pages 45 to 50, they outline disease resistance management for both anthracnose and botrytis. But it's very complicated and to try and explain it in a short webinar would be, uh, would be feasible. Uh, two more diseases I wanted to mention. One is rhizobus fruit rot. This is one that if you ever left a carton of strawberries on your counter for any length of time or even in the refrigerator, this is what you might have seen. Looks like your, your strawberries have grown a beard. This is also known as old, old gray man's beard. Um, we have a white to gray tint to it. Sometimes uh, rhizopus, which is a fungal disease, is joined by another pathogen named, uh, known as mucor. Uh, you can find both together. Sometimes they can be confused. I confuse them. Uh, the blackberries on the right, I found those in my refrigerator a couple of weeks ago after a short vacation. So made for a good picture and, and for this seminar. But uh, so rhizopus fruit rot, it's a, a fungal pathogen, lives on decaying organic matter. The initial infection appears as a discolored water-soaked spot on the fruit, sometimes tannish looking and somewhat soft. Fruit appears to be wounded or where you wounded the fruit, that's where this fungus will attack. Um, under conditions of high relative humidity, the berries will become covered with this coat of white mycelium. It's, it's fungal growth that, that hair you're seeing. And then uh, management is re remove plant debris, this organic matter, remove ripe berries as soon as possible for harvest. Don't let them sit out in the field. And then maybe gen be gentle when you're picking. Avoid bruising the fruit, which can uh, increase incidence of rhizomes, that wound that you cause. And then rapid post-harvest cooling. I think Ash mentioned that for his uh, insect control as well. Uh, cooling them down. It's not going to stop the disease, but it will slow it down. Um, we don't recommend fungicides for rhizomes. Uh, it's mainly a cultural, cultural practices will reduce this problem. Last disease I wanted to talk about is a new disease for Alabama, Neopestalociopsis. <laughs> Such a terrible name. Um, but Dr. Connor found this down in Bruton uh, back in, I believe it was March. Visited a grower down there, a new, new grower for the state. This is a disease, it's a fungal disease that was uh, detected in Florida about three years ago, uh, more recently detected in Georgia. Uh, also in Michigan, Texas, and a few other places, but uh, Dr. Connor was able to first find it in Alabama, down in South Alabama. And this is a disease that appears to be coming in on transplants. But once it gets into the field, it can survive in the soil and on debris and be a, an annual problem, and it can be a severe problem. And you can see some of the significant leaf spots on that plant on the left. And then uh, I took the pictures in the center on the right, but you can see the leaf spot there, but then going, at, going to the fruit. And you get a lesion that looks a little bit like, uh, like anthracnose fruit rot, but it's, it's much, I would say, massive compared in comparison to anthracnose. I should have had them side by side for a year, but then you get that black fruiting structures growing in that lesion itself. And here's more pictures from what I collected a few weeks ago. So uh, really a nasty disease. So it can cause extreme yield loss. It can destroy entire fields. This happened in Florida. It can spread quickly to other fields or within a, within a field and to other fields nearby. Uh, once it is introduced, rain events uh, definitely uh, aggravated or, or I should say uh, help it out and, and spread. Uh, it causes a leaf and fruit spot, as I showed you initially, but eventually it can infect the roots and the crowns of plants, causing plant death. And that's what we're really getting concerned with. So with management, you want to limit operations when, uh, when plants are wet to avoid movement of this disease. If you do see the disease, you want to remove those infected plants as soon as possible and where practical. Uh, as you can't stop it from spreading. And of course, you want to get those plants out of the field so it doesn't uh, establish in the soil itself. So there's been work done in Florida where they've had the disease for a few years. Uh, they've been doing fungicide trials. And I think with one year data, they saw that uh, using something like Thyram and Switch rotated with uh, Thyram or Thyram Captan 
rind tilt or inspire may reduce incidence on the fruit. So they're still working on this to see how effective these fungicide programs are. Uh, Florida also was evaluating our, our current varieties that are available for, see if any had resistance to the disease. And a couple had some, uh, I don't wanna say called tolerance, but it appeared to have a slight level of resistance, but nothing to write home about. And there are uh, programs now trying to develop resistant varieties to this, to this pathogen, though the pathogen is so new that uh, these programs are just getting started. As I said, we found that just in one field in Alabama, came in on transplants, uh, probably coming from Illinois, we believe, or the Midwest. And, um, and it was just on one variety coming from that nursery out of five that the grower planted, which was interesting. So we, uh, we recommended in his case to destroy those plants as soon as possible. So with that, I will stop. Uh, that is me after a long day of picking diseases with a virgin uh, strawberry daiquiri, I believe. But again, my name is Ed Sikora I'm with the Auburn University Cooperative Extension System. You can email me directly at S-I-K-O-R-E-J at auburn.edu. I'll be happy to talk to you there. And then follow me on Twitter uh, if you're interested in the diseases or agriculture in general. I also work with tree fruits, small fruit, uh, vegetables, corn and soybeans, so, and hops and hemp, in fact. So if you have any interest in those crops and you're on Twitter, uh, please follow me. And then uh, again, for disease control, you really want to look at the uh, Southeast guide. Uh, again, the 2022 strawberry IPM guide uh, and look at the disease section, look at the fungicides and look at resistance management. That's all very important. So with that, I'll stop.